Welcome to Global Business Special Session China US Economy Talk live from Beijing. I'm Guan Xing. The year of 2021 is full of uncertainties for China US relations. Whether the world's two largest economies can mend their economic and trade ties and promote mutually beneficial cooperation has big implications for the world. To discuss China US economic ties at this crucial juncture, we are very pleased to be joined by two prominent economists from China and the U.S., Professor Edmund Phelps from Columbia University, Nobel Prize laureate in economics, and Professor Li Daokui from Tsinghua University, Director of Academic Center for Chinese Economic Practice and Thinking. Thank you so much for joining us on this session. Well, now let's put this relationship in the context of COVID-19. The pandemic has taken a toll on the world economy. So what can be done or should be done by the two countries to assist global economic recovery in the post-pandemic era? Professor Phelps, you go first. All right. uh, great to be here. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, what, one thing is that it's very important that China and the U.S. keep trade flows open and financial flows. We have to keep the world economy well-oiled and, and uh, uh, able to function well. Um, also, I think uh, it's very important that uh, China and the United States get together uh, to, to cooperate on, on, on the COVID-19 problems, uh, on the distribution of vaccines and uh, things like that. And, and um, it, it's it's just uh, it's uh, it's it's tragic that uh, the United States has had to function under uh, Trump for four years and has made such a such a mess of things for the world economy and for the United States. But uh, I, I think I think you can I think that the Chinese can count on the Americans gradually to to uh, correct things. Uh, in the United States, and that will uh, that will help the world economy. Uh, it's important that we also we important that we have fair trade. It's important that we re we respect a WTO uh, rules, and it's very important that we keep supply chains open. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a lot of Americans were quite frightened when they thought that they might lose their aspirin or something like that because so much. Of medicines are are, manu are manufactured outside, but that Americans use are are manufactured outside of uh, America. Mm -hmm. Well, supply chain is uh, very important to start with. And Professor Li Daokui, I want to get your opinion on this. What do you think is the most important at this crucial moment? Well, first of all, given that both economies are already so huge, they are number one, number two, respectively, in the world. So number one job for each of the countries is to make sure that their domestic economy to be able to get back on track as quickly as possible. And uh, second, right, uh, right, uh, you know, Professor Phelps was absolutely right. That is, uh, the two countries should really try to keep the trade flow and the capital flow and as much as possible the exchange of information as open as possible. And uh, the third thing I should emphasize at this juncture is for the two countries to share information mm -hmm. about uh, research uh, in their design of vaccine, in the impact of vaccine, in their um, uh, incentive research and monitoring on the possible mutation of the virus. So there are many things two countries can do to each other. These, these two countries can co really cooperate on COVID-19. Uh, they are really coming together, making a tremendous contribution to the rest of the world. Indeed, as the two largest economies, the two countries definitely have their responsibilities. And it seems the two economies are bouncing back strongly uh, this year, especially the U.S., which is even expected to outgrow China. Uh, the uh, Fed Chair Jerome Power surprised the market with a 6.5 percent projection for U.S. economy. But it came at a big cost. The U.S. stimulus, stimulus money has amounted to about five trillion U.S. dollars. Um, Professor Phelps, are you worried about the consequent com inflationary pressure on uh, the U.S. economy and the impact on global economy? Well, there's an enormous amount of uncertainty uh, surrounding <laughs> this subject. 
every economist has his own view. <laughs> and I think every economist is uh, humble enough to admit that we just don't know. But uh, but I tell you that I'm, I'm worried about one thing. Uh, well, there's one thing that I think is of particular interest to China that, um, uh, and, and to the rest of the world uh, in general. Um, when President Ronald Reagan uh, persuaded Congress to legislate a massive tax cut, <clears throat> that was in the 1980s, early 1980s, thus running up a huge fiscal deficit, there was some gain in U.S. investment thanks to the cut in uh, corporate profits taxes. But Outside the United States, interest rates skyrocketed because of the tremendous pressure that, 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 that this fiscal tax cut had caused. It, interest rates skyrocketed in, in, in the rest of the world, and Europe went into a depression, the 1980s depression. So in, it's not inflation I'm worried about so much as I'm worried about uh, depression in the rest of the world. Um, now, of course, uh, the Reagan stimulus and the Biden stimulus are not the same, but I'm still uh, I'm still going to worry about that. Indeed. Well, interest rate hikes could be very disruptive to economic recovery. And Professor Lee, do you think there is an urgency to coordinate monetary policies between the two sides? Because as uh, Professor Edelman Phelps pointed out, that they could affect other countries' economy. Well, there's always a need for coordination uh, among uh, major countries or major economies in the area of monetary policy. However, in reality, it's very hard to, to actually implement the coordination. Now, this time around, this time around, I, uh, I do worry about one thing in addition to what Professor Phelps just mentioned. Uh, that is the financial market in the U.S. may have a big uh, sharp U-turn okay, mm -hmm. down the road. Uh, what's, what has been going on for the past 12 months or maybe even 14 months is that the U.S. Uh, stock market has been doing extremely well, mm -hmm. uh, led by um, a few uh, huge, huge uh, Tesla huge jumping six with, times. <laughs> exactly, with huge uh, com companies with huge market cap. So uh, now we are seeing signs for all for slowing down. Uh, are, are actually a major adjustment. The, these tech companies' shares are coming down, the price are coming down, and meanwhile, uh, natural resources, the oil company shares are coming, are coming up. And so I worry about this. Why? Because, because money may, may suddenly uh, uh, flow back uh, from uh, emerging market economies back to the U.S. economy, because U.S. economy, the, 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 interest, the nominal interest rate is going up, just like... Um, uh, Professor Phelps uh, 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 just argued, mm -hmm. and the share price uh, in, in these companies were co co coming down. That will create a, a sense of um, uh, a sense of uh, a sense of uh, recession mm -hmm. among the Wall Street investors. And so these these things I, I do worry about. I do worry about the uh, uh, stock market in emerging markets and the financial markets overall in emerging market economies. And therefore, we do, I do worry about a, a new round of capital, uh, capital flow from em emerging market economies back to the U.S. I think we're covering different aspects of the same thing, the same phenomenon. Yeah. Indeed. So the recovery is on the way, but really we should be alert about the repercussions of monetary policies, which is very extraordinary at the moment. And, Professor, let's talk about trade. Uh, you know, the two countries were locked in a trade war, which is very a bitter trade war, during most of former President Donald Trump's presidency. And now the terrorists between the two countries is still at unprecedented levels. You know, the uh, Trump blamed China for its trade deficit with the country. However, many economists pointed out that is, is actually resulted in the fundamental imbalance of American economy itself, which is essentially Americans spending more money than it makes. And the gap can be financed by American national debt, which means Americans actually benefit from 
this equation. So, Professor Phelps, what is your view on that? Well, first of all, I can't help uh, note the uh, the uh, irony here. Um, a lot of people work lent their support to Trump, and a lot of people were confident that we've taken a good new direction with Trump. But in fact, it was it became rather clear that he made a total mess of the American economy as well as doing great damage to the world economy. And uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, now, um, <clears throat> I just don't think that um, <clears throat> economists have studied sufficiently the effects of the U.S. trade deficit with China to be able to know how big the gains were and what the losses were. Um, I, 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 but I do recognize the havoc that has been caused by the unpredicted, unpredictable uh, steps in this direction and that direction. Uh, it, there's no question that it's had that, uh, an extremely uh, bad effect uh, uh, on the American economy, but now we've turned the page, and I think we can we can hope to have a a, a more rational uh, more rational conduct uh, by our uh, by America's uh, policy uh, mm -hmm. policy setters. Indeed, it's important to turn the page, but uh, you know that the tariffs are still in place. Uh, it's not clear whether the Biden administration will scale back in these tariffs. Professor Lee, do you think they should do that to scale back the well, tariffs to pre-Trump administration? <coughs> Pull back the tariffs. <coughs> mm -hmm. yeah, at this moment, uh, at this moment, uh, to be very, very frank, okay, the tariff is hurting many, many low-income people in the U.S. Why? Because the tariff uh, imposed on Chinese products sent to the U.S. actually, to a large extent, uh, have uh, uh, that have translated into higher prices in in WalMarts, in Kmart's, uh, in the in in in, in, in U.S. Re uh, retail shops. So and, lo and and a lot of products from China are consumed by low-income people in the U.S. and currently facing uh, inflation pressure. Uh, the U.S. consumers are squeezed. The low-income people are squeezed. So at this moment, I do believe, and I'm, a I'm quite optimistic, that the new administration of the U.S. will, will, cut, cut, will cut down the tariffs. To, uh, instead, what they will do is to focus on a few areas of the bilateral economic uh, relations. For example, they may squeeze even harder on companies like Huawei, and they may even uh, squeeze harder on, on U.S. suppliers of high-tech uh, parts for Chinese high-tech companies. So, so the technology war will replace the tariff war. So this is so good news is the tariff, I, in my view, will come down. The bad news is the tech war may, may intensify. Mm -hmm. We'll try to get to that later in the session. And Professor Phelps, what's your opinion on that? Do you think scaling back tariffs will benefit the U.S. economy and create jobs? Oh, well, I think, I think that that's the direction in which the United States should go. It should go in the direction of, of, of lowering tariffs. But um, I, my, my own opinion on this is, is that um, I, although I don't, I don't doubt that many of the new tariffs that were instituted uh, should be reversed. I don't doubt that. That is uh, certainly uh, it, true. I think, but but we 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 learn from experimentation, and and uh, maybe uh, maybe we see now some of the ill effects of, of of tariffs on the American economy. So I think there's every reason to 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 uh, to hope that. Um, a lot of those uh, tariffs will will indeed uh, be uh, removed. Um, 
maybe I, maybe I, I don't want to get ahead of the uh, plan here, but let me say that um, uh, we shouldn't be talking about tariffs in general. We really, unfortunately, we have to talk about individual tariffs when we have to ask ourselves, well, if the United States were to, to cut these tariffs, would that cause serious harm to low wage workers in, in certain industries? We do have to worry about those th things. So there's, there's, a, there's a dimension of equity or, or uh, economic justice, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. that, that, that has to be brought into the picture. We can't, the United States can't just cut all tariffs um, because free trade is a good idea. Free trade is a good idea, but we have to qual qualify it. And they, uh, we should agree that not everyone benefited from globalization in the free trade. Well, Professor Li Daokui, you mentioned the tech war, and we noticed a signal in China's new five-year plan, which has the emphasis on uh, reducing, uh, to reduce its dependence on, uh, to uh, reduce its dependence on foreign supply chains, to to achieve self-reliance on key technologies. What do you think about the signal? Is it uh, due to the wake-up call? about the U.S. ban on the semiconductor export to China? Well, the, I, I, well in the short run, in, in the short run, in, indeed, the President, President Trump's policies of uh, squeezing companies like Huawei did wake up Chinese policymakers and the Chinese enterprises uh, in that sense that they have to be more self-dependent, uh, self-reliant on, on technology. However, uh, if you put it, this one into a larger context, China is now moving very close to the threshold of high-income countries. At this stage, China, regardless of U.S. policy, has to be more reliant on technological progress for its economic growth. So unlike before, China could rely upon the increase in capital, increase in labor. From now on, China has to be much more dependent upon indigenous uh, technological innovation. So I, I do think that this is the right direction to go uh, for a country like, like China, uh, regardless of the what's, whatever the U.S. policy. So I do not think the Chinese policy is only meant to hedge against possible U.S. Uh, policies against Chinese tech, tech companies. Okay? And that being said, uh, I also argue, I, I, was, I would also argue that China's policy on speeding up indigenous technological progress actually is eventually beneficial for everybody, including the U.S. Why? Because with more Chinese technology in supply, the U.S. companies would have to be work, working much harder. They have to work much harder. The U.S. federal government will have to restore a lot of the support for scientific research. For example, the NSF, the National Science Foundation, was weighing down. The NSF was cut. The support for the NSF was cut to the dismay of many scientists and academics in the U.S., which is wrong policy, which started even under President Obama's uh, uh, administration. But with Chinese competition, the NSF very likely will, come, will, will, will be boosted. For example, uh, Chuck Schumer, the, the senator from uh, New York, right, Professor Phelps, your, 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 your district, your state, right? Chuck Schumer proposed a big, big program to boost U.S. federal government support for scientific research. I think this is, this is wonderful. This is wonderful. Ameri American colleagues should thank China for that. Okay? Let me stop here. I think so. it's a win-win situation for everybody. Competition in, in technology, in principle, is good. And they, uh, we do thank that. We do thank China for that. <laughs> and China will have to thank America for showing right. the importance of and the possibility of sustained growth. I think there's been way too much single-minded focus on trade and the associated problems. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, it, 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 it's very important for China to, to devote major attention to, to 
economic growth. I don't mean the, the, the rise of GDP from this year to next year. I mean, sustained growth over the next few decades. And, 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 and to do that, to, to achieve that, China is going to need investment and, and, to, and to ensure that there are investment opportunities, China is going to need, sure, innovation from the outside, but China is a big country now and it's going to need innovation from the inside. Uh, and 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 I think, I think this is the way economic discussion should be uh, pointed uh, increasingly uh, o o over the next months and, and next years. Is what can Ch what can China do to become a to to have a a a uh, a fast growing economy with wage rates that are rising not just because of improvements in allocation or not just because of uh, education, but a sustained upward push coming from new ideas, new techniques leading to uh, innovation. Mm -hmm. Well, a healthy competition will definitely uh, create a win-win outcome for all the parties. And Professor uh, Li Daokui, when you look at China's five-year plan, do you see more cooperation opportunities with the U.S. or more competition in certain sectors? What's the future direction? Well, already there are few areas uh, in which uh, China is positioned to cooperate with the U.S. Let me mention just one, that is the area of uh, moving towards carbon neutrality. Mm -hmm. uh, I do believe that in the 14th five-year plan, China uh, uh, will eventually announce uh, certain programs like uh, enormously boosting uh, China's supply of uh, renewable energy, especially solar, pa solar panel. So when doing this, when doing this, China not only makes contribution to the world's efforts of controlling uh, or mitigating climate change, also, also by doing this, China is pushing down the price of uh, uh, PV panels, that is the panel to generate uh, solar power, okay? So China will become a huge supplier of PV panels, and in the process, because of the economy of scale, the price of PV can will come down, which will be a good news for the rest of the world. The rest of the world will be able to use lower, to, you, to incur lower costs in generating electricity. And therefore, there will be a faster pace of phasing out coal and other um, other carbon uh, emission uh, in the uh, in their own countries. So in this area, clearly, is this uh, area in which the 14th five-year plan opens up collaboration with uh, the U.S. and other countries. Mm -hmm. Well, that should be the future direction uh, to benefit the two peoples. And Professor Phelps, what do you think about the uh, cooperation opportunities for the two sides in the future to foster growth and boost innovation for both China and the U.S.? Um, oh, I'm, I'm sure there will be plenty of opportunities for gains in, 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 in cooperation uh, in, in scientific research and, and, uh, and, and uh, in uh, industrial research, uh, lots of gains. But, you know, China is a, a huge country with a huge economy, and it, it, it doesn't really need the United States to... to, to come up with, with uh, new methods of production, new products. Uh, it, 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 it can, most of these gains will be done and will have to be done by China it, it itself. Uh, United States has, has lost its touch in this area for a long time now. It, it, it's not any, the United States is not the economy that it was between, let's say, the 1860s and, and the 1960s, when it just tore up the place with incredible rates of growth, incredible industrial change, uh, that's gone. And uh, w the whole world is, is looking, I think, for um, new sources of, of uh, new ideas, technical advances, 
and, and uh, China can play a, an immense role uh, in in uh, restoring uh, economic growth to the to the to the world as a whole, and, and uh, in short, China can replace the United States as a source of um, economic growth through innovation. Well, certainly um, more uh, mutually. Fel, might, might be too polite. Uh, but okay. Professor Fel, Go ahead. Fel, no, no, I'm polite. being quite <laughs> realistic. <laughs> well, the U.S., the U.S., especially U.S. universities and academics are still leading in the world. U.S. universities and uh, are still leading, and also U.S. still has wonderful, wonderful companies in Tesla, in uh, in uh, Microsoft, so on and so forth. So. I do think uh, U.S. still will be able to lead in many areas. Therefore, uh, the two countries should uh, really collaborate with each other. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's very kind of you to say those things. But, you know, uh, it's true. The, it was the United States that produced the information revolution between uh, roughly uh, 1995 and 2005. But that's a tiny part of the American economy. What about the other 95%? Very stagnant, and and, and uh, that's why I personally am looking to China to maybe come up with some new products, new methods. Why not? It's 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 an open field waiting to be uh, developed. Well, I, I have to say that both of you are very open-minded and real uh, idealistic, because. Uh, some people say uh, they think that as China gradually moves up the value chain, uh, they are challenging the interest previously dominated by American companies. So we have here such comments from uh, tech executives and other people to counter China's rise in tech space. Professor Lee, what do you think about, do you think there, it means the conflicts is inevitable in some sectors, such as 5G, artificial well, intelligence. Well, with, with technological innovation, uh, all existing companies, whether they are the U U.S. companies or Chinese companies, will face challenges. Okay, that's that's true everywhere, everywhere. Okay, so I do not think it's particularly the Chinese uh, companies which are creating. Uh, uh, problems for the U.S. companies, rather it's new companies creating problems for old companies. So uh, in this regard, I do mm -hmm. agree with Professor Phelps that, that the, the continued growth of China, especially continued growth of Chinese technological companies, will be good for the whole world. That's the game. That's the game. Mm -hmm. Competition in this regard is healthy, okay? That's game. Or vice versa, uh, the coming up of U.S. companies like Tesla also uh, uh, has created uh, challenges for Chinese company. Look at, look at Tesla. Uh, it's doing wonderful, wonderful in China. Okay, Tesla is now by now by far the largest uh, producer of uh, of electrical cars or high, at least high end electrical cars. Okay, so I think this is the, this is the nature of economic competition and the economic growth worldwide. So let's do not blame China or do not blame the U.S. That's that's the game. That's how we progress mm -hmm. as human beings. Mm -hmm. Professor Phelps, do you want to weigh in on this? I have one more question. How to promote those, those, fair those are, those are, those and uh, rule-based competition? Because this is important for a competition to be healthy and benefit beneficial. Professor Phelps? Well, competition is uh, very, competition is very important. Um, uh, we don't want to depend upon uh, monopolies to see whether they feel inclined or happen to have the inspiration to uh, find uh, to 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 uh, have, find a new way of producing something or find a, a new something to produce. Uh, we we want to have competing firms so that a firm has to innovate if it is to survive. Mm -hmm. I think that was uh, one of the secrets of the American success 
from the 1860s to the 1960s, it, there was a lot of competition. And when, there, when monopolies arose, as in the time of Theodore Roosevelt in the early 1900s, hundreds, they, the government closed it down, broke up the oil monopolies, for example, the oil monopoly. Uh, it was well understood that there should be competition. Um, and and uh, the, the, other, the other secret of the American success was that um, people were encouraged, people of all ranks and files, people of, people of all sorts of backgrounds, people in farming and mining and manufacturing and, and service industries, all those people were brought, were, were, were lived in a society that doted on new things. Um, Abraham Lincoln in uh, 1968 made a tour of the country to decide whether he might run for president. And he realized that um, Americans were, 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 were had a, a uh, almost almost an insane uh, admiration and an affection for new things, and and, and, and um, so that's and, and so this desire for new things permeated society down to ordinary people, and it, it isn't just a a it just it, it is innovation is not up to uh, the National Science Foundation or China's counter counterparts, rapid innovation is going to depend upon innovation coming up from people in all walks of life, different backgrounds, different abilities. People coming in, grassroots innovation, that was the American secret. Well, hopefully we can bring that American spirit back in the future, but because from what I see, it seems uh, some, Amer uh, some of the policies are not fair. For example, some of the uh, policies against Chinese tech companies are not fair. Um, and um, the American is calling for fair competition and rule-based competition. What do you think about these uh, sanctions and delisting measures against Chinese companies? Professor Lee. Well, I think there are three things. Two sides need, really need to ne uh, need to negotiate and really to cooperate. And uh, the, the first thing, or in, rather, first principle, the first principle is for both sides to agree to incur to make sure that their companies uh, respect intellectual property rights. Okay, it used to be that the Chinese side were uh, alleged were claimed uh, or believed to be stealing the U.S. technology. But, no, but I, I assure you, nowadays, the Chinese companies are very eager to enhance uh, uh, protection of intellectual property rights. This afternoon, I had a meeting with a Chinese entrepreneur who actually filed for a wonderful patent uh, with the U.S. Bureau of Tech, with, the, with the U.S. Bureau of Patent. Okay? So the Chinese are now in being, uh, are holding more and more patents. So uh, that's the first principle. The, enhance the awareness or make sure uh, that intellectual property rights are uh, are respected second is to 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 treat the companies of from the other country equally as companies from your own country let's call it national identity national treatment okay so regardless of the orange uh, the origin okay w once the uh, companies are operating in china and the u.s let's treat them equally okay the third thing, also important, is to treat all companies, regardless whether they are state-owned companies or private companies or multinationals, to be equal. Okay, equal treatment, equal treatment of all companies. Okay, so I think these are the three principles. I truly hope that leaders are from both countries can really work on each other. If the two countries can work out this, uh, this uh, well, make progress in this in these regards. The two economies, I, I, I'm, I'm optimistic, will be able to cooperate with each other, and they will, together they will make bigger contribution to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Professor Feld, do you want to weigh in on this? Cooperate and compete. 
<laughs> exactly, exactly. Cooperate meaningfully and compete uh, healthily, right? <laughs> okay, so Thanks. let's... Healthy competition. Yeah, let's yeah. end this conversation on this positive note. Thank you so much for your wonderful insights, Professor Adam Phelps and Professor Li Daogui. Well, coming up so in our next episode, next episode okay. in our uh, global business special uh, program, China U.S. Economy Talk, is uh, we will have Professor Jason Foreman from Harvard University and chair of the Council of Economic Advisors to former U.S. President Barack Obama and Professor Zhu Jiandong from Tsinghua University. So stay tuned. And I'm Guanxing in Beijing. Until next time, bye for now.